Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Celebration Church this morning. Let's stand and worship God this morning. This morning, we're going to start off with a song called Closer. Closer to your kingdom, God. Closer to you, God. We worship you. There is no one. There is no Oh, yeah. 
praise to you, God. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this new day that we get to come here, another day that we get to come into your house. And to praise your name and to go into you and just worship you. So God, I pray that you just fill this place with your spirit. Fill this place with your presence, God. We're hungry for you. We're hungry for your word, God. We're starving after you, God. Come on, let's sing this song. Can I get an amen if the Lord has done great things in your life? Worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has a great name. Come on, see what I see. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has a great name. Yes, God. God, you the great. We conquer the grave, we freed and we captain, we break every chain, oh God, you have the great Come on, we dance in your freedom, we dance in your freedom, awake in the light, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name here divine, oh God, you have the great
this bridge one more time. Let's proclaim it out to God that you have done great things for us, God, and we're so thankful for it, God. Let's sing it out one more time. Hallelujah. Above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, have done great things. Come on, let's sing it one more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God, above it all.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Amen. Good morning. Listen, we you should never get tired of singing how powerful his name is. Amen. We should never get tired of celebrating Jesus. Here's the reason why. Because they do it 24-7 in heaven. And they've been doing it from eternity past. They'll keep doing it from eternity future. And they never get tired and bored of doing it. Right? Amen. They never get tired. And, and, and listen. Listen, I just want to praise him this morning for what he's done. Amen. Amen. Can we just give him a hand clap of praise? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Amen. 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 And amen. Please be seated this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you, worship team. Man, these guys work really hard every week and they just pour out. And uh, so thank you guys for doing that every single week. And um, before we dive into our teaching time today, uh, by the way, my name is Rob. I'm the lead pastor here. And on behalf of my wife, Gina and I, and thank you so much, Rashad, and our, and our whole entire faith family. If you're a guest today, welcome. Right? And if you say, well, I want to know what this celebration church is all about, I can make it for you real simple. We're all about Jesus. From beginning to end and everything in the middle. Right? Because it's something happens when you make it all about him. Amen? Sinners get saved. Right? People get delivered and set free. Isn't that awesome? Relationships get restored when you make it all about Jesus. So we want to welcome you this morning. Thank you if you are a guest with us today. We special welcome to you and thank you for being with us. We're so excited that you're with us today. So let me make you aware of just a few things. And then they're going to lead us in a little chorus again. And then we're going to dive into our teaching time. First things first, if this is your new uh, first time with us, we have a big kids church called Kids Celebrate. We all like to worship together in the music part of worship. Right, But if you would love your child to go to Kids Celebrate, it's right there in the worship guide. You should have received one of these when you came in today. It tells you how to get them checked in and all the ages and things like that. We have one of our kids directors at the very back. Her name is Hope. Right, She's right here to my left, your right. If you would love your child to go this morning, they can go ahead and be exited out. And she's going to take them out to my left and to your right, okay? Let me make something very important. If you have not checked your child in electronically, we ask that you do that. Go with your child now because we take your child's safety and security very seriously. And you're going to get a little label. They're going to get a little label. We just want to make sure we're matching the right kid with the right family. How, can, we, can I get an amen on that? Amen, right? Some of the mothers are like, praise God, right? Right, We take it very, very seriously here, and we would love for you to do that if you have not done that already. Uh, the second thing I'll make you aware of is there's a Connect card in the back of every seat right there in front of you. It looks just like this. If you are a guest or you've been maybe just a few times, we would love for you to fill this out. Let us know that you're with us today. Okay, Listen, we're not going to bother you, harass you. We're not going to show up at your door or anything like that. But we are going to send you an, either an email, a letter, or a text message saying, thank you for being in worship with us and how you can learn more about our heart and our mission. But there's one very, very important thing on there for every one of us today. Maybe you are far away from Jesus today. And we believe that Jesus is in the saving business seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And if he saves you today, it says right there, I have decided to follow Jesus. Maybe you're like what I was 20 years ago, a a prodigal who had just went far away from God, but he called me home. Amen. If that's you today, we would love to. Or maybe you need to follow in believer's baptism or you need to talk to a minister. Whatever the case may be, that card is there for you. And all you simply do is drop it in one of the brown boxes here. There's one right to the very back and then one right here when you walk out. There's even a sign that tells you where to put it. Okay, so we've made it really, really simple uh, for you. The third thing is I'll make you aware of is about inviting someone. Okay, Uh, we're really big about inviting people to Jesus. Now listen to me. We would love for them to come here selfishly, but all I care about is if they meet Jesus. So if that's first Baptist so and so or second Methodist so and so or third Pentecostal fourth, you know, four and a half, whatever, charismatic church down the street, whatever the case may be, this is just a small part of God's universal church. But invite someone. Ask the Holy Spirit Who would you have me invite? Because you never know when your simple invitation could lead to someone else's supernatural transformation. And let me tell you something. Whenever God uses you the first time to lead someone to the foot of the cross, I promise you'll get addicted to it. 
Amen. You'll want to see more people saved. And there's 20,000 people in this area that are either far away from God, that don't know God, or don't have a church home. And listen, we would love to be that for them. A couple of things I'll make you aware of just real quickly is one about the VBS. This starts tomorrow night. If you have not signed up for VBS to help or to serve in some way, get with our kids director or one of our kids team. We would love to have you here. Every year, God does amazing things, and we would love for you to be on board with that. And then the other thing is, do we have a slide for the child dedication? I can't remember if we put it in there. Okay. We've had several people ask us about child and baby dedications. If you have a grandchild or a newborn child or someone who's never been dedicated to the Lord, we are doing that on 623 of 19. Okay. We are doing that on 623 of 19. We will have a sign up sheet for you next week out here in our guest services area that you can sign up. We would love to know if you would like us to uh, walk through that with your family. Just pray over them and dedicate them to the Lord. Listen, I, I want to say this before we transition. Um, I know sometimes you guys have heard my story and most of you know I grew up in a very hyper charismatic church and well, very sincere people. There were some things there, but very sincere people. But I believe one of the reasons that I'm here today is because my mom dedicated me to the Lord when I was a young child. And see, no matter where you're at today, you may be saying, well, Rob, that was me too, but I'm far away. You don't know my story, man. I've been running for years. Friend, I was too. But you will never outrun the love and the grace of God. See, if he has a call and a purpose for you, right? You'll never out the cross of Christ. Amen. I want you to see it. Some of you don't believe that, but it's true. You want to know why I know it's true? Because he saved me. That's how I know it's true. There's an old song that we used to sing in the church I grew up in, and we did a lot of Southern gospel when I grew up, and that's okay. God uses Southern gospel, and God uses hymns, and God uses this. But there was a song that said, I was there when it happened. So I guess I ought to know. Well, 20 years ago at North Mississippi Medical Hospital, I was there when God rescued me from the depths of hell. So because I was there, I'm telling you, it's true. And here's the cool thing. God is not a respecter of persons, and he will save you too. Isn't that awesome? So here's what we're going to do real quickly before we dive into our our teaching time today. I'm going to ask Sarah and, and Peyton to, can we do that bridge one more time? I just love declaring that God has no rival. He has no equal. Amen. The Bible says that he uses the earth as his footstool. Right? Can you believe that? In other words, for some of you younger people, God's a boss. Right? That's how he rolls. Okay? So can we sing that again before we dive into our teaching time? If you know it, sing it with us. Come on, if you know it, help us sing it this morning. Church. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name on, One more time, come on. What a powerful name, one more time. What a powerful 
Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you. And I pray that for the first time today, there will be people in this building that will begin to grasp the power that is in the name of Jesus. The power to save, the power to heal, the power to deliver, the power to set free, the power to put broken hearts back together. So Jesus, would you continue to be magnified in this building? Holy Spirit, would you do what only you can do? And would you illuminate the words of Christ to our hearts today? God, we love you. We pray for every church in this region. That the gospel would go forth. That our love would be loud in Tupelo, Mississippi today for Jesus. Will you say amen with me today? Amen and amen and amen. Thank you guys so much. Worship team, appreciate you guys. Amen, amen. There's just been a little buzzing thing. It's one of those audio problems, so bear with me. You may get scared a little bit. I promise it's not a trick or anything like that. It's just one of those things. We've laid hands on it, poured oil on it, did everything else we could do, and uh, here we are, okay? So I want to welcome you again, and as I said, my name is Rob, and I wore this today up here because um, I want to let everybody know that every week you may see people wearing these, and these are people that have committed every week. We call them the dream team, and they get here early every Sunday, and you know why they do it? Because they want to serve you for the glory of God. Amen. So if you need something today and you say, well, I don't know where the bathrooms are. I don't know where I can get a cup of coffee or whatever. Look for someone that has a little tag like this and they'll direct you in the right direction. All right. Amen. Aren't you glad you have a dream team to serve you every week? That's so awesome. Thank you guys. Those guys are awesome. They get here and they vacuum and they clean and they do all this kind of stuff. And here's the cool thing. Nobody makes them do it. They just love doing it for the glory of God because they know that God is setting people free every week. Isn't that awesome? That's so good, isn't it? It's so good. Well, it's great to be back with you guys. Many of you know we were out last Sunday, and I pray that my friend Jacob Hollis poured into you guys. Love that dude, man. He was Him and Megan attended here for a while, and they're up in Hernando, and uh, they're planning to come back here again next year. And just amazing to see when you begin to disciple and pour into people what God will do. Amen. So I pray that you are blessed. Uh, by that. I always forget to do this, so I'm, I'm, make, I'm getting, a better habit of, getting a better habit of doing this, but I want to welcome all those online. If you're watching us today, will you drop us a comment and let us know where you're, where you're watching us from, or how can we pray for you, or if the message blesses you, we would love to hear from you. And before I get started, I wanted to show you uh, before they put the picture up and talk to you, most of you know this, that we, we got to go to Disney World for about, about seven days, right? And dreams do come true, but they're very expensive dreams uh, when you go to Disney World, right? And, and, and so we walked about eight to 10 miles a day. We had the little iWatch thing clocking us, and we were shaking, baking in the heat. It was about 93 and 95 every day we were there. And, uh, you know, I, I manned up this time. I, I rode more roller coasters than I did 11 years ago. Am I right, babe? Am I telling the truth? All right. My 10-year-old still called me out on a few that... I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't do some of them, but the Holy Spirit gave me the boldness to ride. I graduated, and in 10 more years, I'll probably graduate a little bit more. But as we were sitting there taking pictures, there was one picture I asked my wife to send me. And uh, I, I don't know if the Lord spoke to me prophetically through it or whatever, but we'll put it on the screen, and we'll see what you think. Can we put that one picture on the screen here? And uh, that is a massive turkey leg, Okay. I did this exact same thing 11 years ago and went because I love big turkey legs. I will smash on some turkey. Can I get an amen? I lo- All right. And, and so the Lord began to speak to me. I don't know if it's for this audience or not, but he said, man, what if we were a church that smashed on the word of God like I'm smashing on this turkey leg in this picture? Right. Let me put it in another way, because some of you don't know what the word smash means. You think I'm getting violent for whatever reason. Right. In, in other words, what if we consumed the word of God like a ravenous wolf in this picture? What if we consumed God's word like that? Can I just tell you something? Your life would go from victorious level here to victorious level here because of the word of God. Amen. I don't know if that's prophetic or not. Maybe it's just me meeting a turkey leg. But Holy Spirit said, show it. And so I would show it and you take it for what it is, right? You could see I really love that turkey leg, right? Juice is flying everywhere. I mean, what if we consumed the word of God like that? Amen. Maybe you just need to imagine it's a big turkey leg from Disney World. I don't know, right? But praise God, I promise you, you can never go wrong by consuming God's word. Uh, The second thing I'll make a mention real quickly is we do not have sermon notes. If you are a guest today, we generally have sermon notes to follow along. But as I was preparing while we were in Disney and coming back this week, 
Uh, I just really felt just to kind of more talk to you, and if you want to make notes, you can, maybe in, in your iPhone or your smart device or maybe on a piece of paper, but today I just want to share with you a few points, uh, and I want to piggyback off a series that we were in for three weeks called The G Word, where we talked about grace, and so I want to be, I'm going to be in John chapter 8. They're going to put the scripture on the screen for us, okay? John chapter 8. This is the CSB version. Somebody told me it's God's favorite version in 2019, so I went with it, okay, last, the previous few years it was ESV and then it was the NASB and you know whatever but I promise you he does like all of the versions I'm just teasing okay but we're going to be in the CSV version today and we're going to be reading about this story of grace I just want to piggyback off this series and I want to talk to you about a few things about this particular story uh, in the gospel so let me let me just give you a little background just in case you didn't grow up in church Uh, We are really big about reaching people that don't go to church or far away from church or maybe have never been in church or maybe don't know much about the Bible. And I always like to do this before we start, okay? We are going to be in the Gospel of John, which was written by one of Jesus' disciples that he commissioned. He was a fisherman, and he made him fisher of men, okay? And so just like Matthew, right, who was commissioned by Jesus, is, is a gospel, right? And then there's Mark. Right, and then there's Luke, and then there's the Gospel John. What I want you to understand about the Gospel of John is this, and I find it very interesting, and, and I wrote it in my notes here that the Gospel of John, ninety percent of the content in the Gospel of John is different from the other three Gospels. Okay? This is why it's important that you read your, your Bible, right? The other three Gospels are what we call synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, meaning they have a similar point of view. Right? So you can read those Gospels, and there's a lot of similarities, and then you can read John's Gospel, right? And it explicitly doesn't state John wrote the Gospel in his Gospel, but he refers to himself as the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. So he had a very intimate and close relationship with Jesus. Here's why I bring that up. Because this passage of Scripture I'm going to talk to you today about is not in some of your Bible translations, Okay? So let me, let me, I wrote it here so I would say this correctly because I want to make sure that we all understand, okay? I don't have to defend the Bible, right? I don't have to. The Bible has stood the test of time. But I do want to be honest with you that if you're reading from a different version today, there may be a footnote in there. This may not be in there. So let me put it to you this way. This portion of scripture is widely viewed by scholars as not in the appropriate place in the Bible. In other words, this particular story most scholars believe it should have been in a different place, okay? Now, listen to me. However, most scholars believe that it's authoritative, meaning it is Scripture, okay? Now, I'm going to leave it there because I hope that you will go research it, right? You should never take my word for it, right? I love you, and I thank you for the trust, but you should always go read the Bible yourself, Right? You should always ask the Holy Spirit to reveal. I don't have to defend the Bible. It's there. Okay? I'm just telling you, when you read and you research this stuff, they believe this portion of Scripture is authoritative, but some people believe that it may be in a different part of the Bible. Now, here's the thing. Whether it's in Luke 18 or Revelation 7 or whatever, the bottom line is it's the Word of God. I can care less where it's at in the Bible. I just need to consume it. Right? Does that make sense? You with me? Okay. All right, so I wanted to get that out of the way because I never want to take it for granted that everybody is on the same page when it comes to reading the Bible. So let's dive into this story of grace today, and we're going to read. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he went to the temple again, and all the people were coming to him. He sat down and began to teach them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees, and I'll pause there for a minute. These are actually two different groups of people, right? Scribes could be Pharisees and Pharisees could be scribes, but it doesn't mean that they were all the same. Does that make sense? It doesn't mean all scribes were Pharisees and vice versa. Okay, so these are two different groups of people, okay, that, that, that are here. It says that the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, making her stand in the center. Some versions say caught in the act of adultery. Teacher, they said to him, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery in the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? They asked this to trap him in order that they might have evidence to accuse him. Jesus stooped down and started writing with on the ground with his finger, right? Now to me, because I have a sense of humor, 
this kind of cracks me up a little bit that something this serious, Jesus just goes. Right? Because how many of us religious people would be freaking out? I mean, let's be real. We're in the Bible Belt. That's how, that's how we roll here. We'd be like, oh, my God. Right? We would have a bag of stones out back, wouldn't we? Ready to go. Right? I want you to see this now. This is very important that you see this. Jesus stooped down and started right on the ground with his finger. When they persisted in questioning him, he stood up and said to him, the one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. Okay? Then he stooped down again. So not only does it one time, but he does it a second time after he drops this mic drop statement. And he says, then he stooped down again and continued writing on the ground. And here's the thing. I've heard a lot of preachers speculate on what he was writing. I prefer not to do that just because I'm, if the Bible doesn't say it, I'm just going to leave it like it is, right? And, and, and I just don't want to add to it. Does that make sense? I'm not saying you're going to go to hell because you did or whatever. I'm just saying I just don't, we don't know what he wrote because the Bible didn't tell us to. Right? Here's another thing to research. This is not the first time that God wrote like this with his finger. See, that's another thing you need to go research. Amen? Okay, here we go. Then he stooped down again and continued right on the ground. When they heard this, they left one by one, starting with the older men. Only he was left with the woman in the center. When Jesus stood up, he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, she answered. He says, neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Go, and from now on, do not sin anymore. Now, what's interesting about this story is that there was this Feast of Tabernacles or Feast of Booths or in the Hebrew, the Sukkot, right, that commemorated where the children of Israel were in the wilderness and they lived in these tents or booths, if you will. So this was going on. And what I find interesting is that this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Now, I've never seen much of this show, but there was a show on TV, I don't even know if it's still on TV anymore, called Cheaters, okay? And what they would do is, I guess you would call into the show or send an inquiry, and they would help you with a camera crew and this guy go track down your cheating significant other, okay? I don't know if this was the Hebrew version of that. I don't know what was going on here, but for them to go and search out someone caught in the act. I want you to see this because it all plays a part in this story, caught in the act of adultery. The other thing I want you to see is not only is this, this, this festival going on, this celebration commemorating the children of Israel's dependence on God, right? But the other thing is there's no man mentioned. Where's the other party? Because how many people know it takes two to tango, right? Is the old saying, right? So what we see here also is not only this overly religious culture, but we also see this overly chauvinistic culture. Okay. I'm just being real with you. These aren't fun things to talk about. I'd rather talk about other things, but they're in the Bible. So we have to, okay. Right. And so we don't see the man, right? We only see the woman, and, and the other thing is the scribes, let me just read this to you, were professional copyists and scholarly experts or theologians who were to be consulted over the details of the written law of Moses. See, and although their original heart was in the right place in preserving the law of Moses, what had happened is them and the Pharisees, right, the overly religious, had begun to pervert it and use it in the wrong way. See, let me tell you something. I want to stop for a minute. You can know the word of God backwards and forwards and praise God for you. The body of Christ needs you to be a scribe or even to be a Pharisee in this sense. Not all Pharisees were bad. You understand? I know Jesus had a lot of run-ins with them, but they believed in preserving the law of Moses. They believed in the accuracy of scripture. They believed in, be, in living holy. The problem was when they began to use scripture, or in this case, the Old Testament, to abuse, to exclude, and to hurt people. And do you know, if we're not careful, we can do the same thing. We can sit here and close our doors and come in here and worship our God and use the scripture out of context. I see it every week on Facebook about 100 million times. Okay? And what happens is we could exclude the very people that Jesus came to save if we're not careful. Okay, so we have this festival going on. We have no man in the picture, right? We have these two groups of religious people. And by the way, if you know anything about the Apostle Paul, 
right? He wrote, he wrote much of the New Testament. You've probably heard of his story. He said that he was a Pharisee. Actually, he said, I'm the, I was the Pharisee. I'm the poster child Pharisee, okay? So God could even use the most religious person for his glory, amen? So I want, I want you to see that real quickly as we dive in. Other thing. They bring this woman to him, and really, they don't bring it because they're sincere. See, there's one thing to bring someone before the church or to go to your brother and sister, as the Bible commands us to do if we have ought, right? We don't do that anymore in this culture. We just text or go get 10 other people, but really, the Bible says to go to one another. This was not sincere motives in bringing this woman before Jesus because they hated Jesus. They were using this sinful situation to try to trick Jesus. Okay, let let me tell you how. Number one is they were trying to trick him because if Jesus says stone her, he goes against the Roman law that capital punishment has to be done through their judicial system. See, when the Romans would take over a people, they would allow them to worship. They were a polytheistic culture. But what what happened when it came to capital punishment is it had to be done through the Roman judicial system. See, so they were gonna get Jesus because if Jesus said to stone her, According to the law of Moses, how many people know they'd be tattletailing to the Romans, right? Am I, am I right? That, that, that's, that's, that's what happened. On the other hand, if he says, don't stone her, then the Jews will claim he's a heretic because he's going against the law of Moses. See? You see the, you see the tricky situation here? You ever been in one of those situations, by the way? Right? It's like a a lose-lose, right? And so this is this whole situation. And what I find interesting about this is the only one that was fully qualified and sovereign to judge in this situation chose to lead with grace. And the reality is we don't have the power to do any, but we always lead the other way in most cases. I'm just being real with you. Can, Can we be real online? Okay, the one that could have judged, the one who was perfect, the one that was sinless chose to lead with grace, but yet we have the pow- no, no power to judge or to forgive sins, and we always lead the other way in most cases. But if we're going to be Christ-uns, we need to be leading the way Christ would lead. Amen? Come on now. I, I, I know this is a little, maybe a little scandalous for some of you, but if you haven't read the gospel lately, it's very scandalous that God would step in and love depraved, wicked sinners and go to the cross 2,000 years ago and die in our place. I would say that's pretty scandalous, wouldn't you? Amen. Amen. So on one hand, he loses. On the other hand, he loses. But I find it interesting that he leads with grace. He leads forgiveness. Now, the other thing I want you to see here, and then I want to share with you a few points, is I want you to see that Jesus didn't say, where are your accusers? And she said, I don't know where they're at. Notice he didn't say, go change your behavior, go obey all the laws of Moses, right? Notice he didn't say that. Notice he didn't give her a 10-step program. Here's why. I I want you to see this because I need you to see this because he was after her heart, not her behavior. See, religiosity, man-made religiosity always wants to control and modify the behavior. And listen, we've all been guilty of this. We've all been guilty of coming to church going, how's it going, brother? Well, God is good all the time and all the time God is good. God is doing great things in my life because we feel like we have to put this this superficial fake thing on instead of coming in and somebody going, listen, man, I desperately need Jesus today. Right? Or we have this poster child for a good Christian, right? They don't cuss. They don't drink. They don't go to the bars. They don't swear. They don't watch rated R movies. They... I I mean, come on, some of you are laughing, but it's true. Just like the Pharisees and scribes, they had taken the law of Moses, which was pure, which was a good thing to preserve it, but they had superseded, or excuse me, put above that the oral traditions of men, 
where there was more emphasis on the oral traditions of men than there was on the gospel. The same thing is happening in this America today. Well, we're taking things and we're making things up and we're putting that above the scripture. And friends, when we ever do that, we're no longer leading with grace. We are in error. Right? But this is what we do. This is a perfect Christian. Don't this and don't do that and don't. And what we teach people is that when they come to church, that they have to change their behavior before God will accept them. And that's nowhere in the gospel. And we teach people external behavior modification instead of grace that reaches the very core of these wicked hearts. See, grace always works from the inside out. Man-made religion always works from the outside in. And when you capture someone's heart, the behavior will begin to change. You see, this is what Jesus was saying here. I want you to see this. I love the way Pastor Mark Driscoll puts it. And I think we have the quote back there. He says this, grace outperforms law. You'll do things for love you wouldn't do for duty. See, some of us in our Christian walk, or maybe if you've been far away from God for a season, or maybe you just walked away from everything because you got caught up in this. And I know, and listen, I'm not hating on the people that I grew up with because they're very sincere people. But a lot of times it was very works-based and very duty-centered And I tell people, I didn't really hear about the grace of God until I was about 30 years old. And I grew up in church my whole life because it was all about my behavior and doing stuff. And I never knew what it meant to be madly in love with Jesus. Now that sounds silly to some of you, but if I grew up in church and felt that way, how many others, many of thousands and millions of people in this world feel that way? We need to do a better job of teaching grace. That grace is not a license to sin. It's a license to live above the power of sin. See? But what we tend to do a lot of times in our sermons, in our programs, is focus on this. And I love this, that grace outperforms law. You'll do things for love you wouldn't do for duty. Has anybody ever been in love? Raise your hand if you've ever been in love. Real quickly. It's okay. We're not going to sell you nothing. Okay. Some of you are like, sure, you're like... I guess, if you want to call it that, (laughs) right? Please don't call her or him the old ball and chain. That never goes really well. If you need marriage counseling, we're available after church today, okay? But when you were young and in love, right, didn't you kind of just break all the rules to be with one another? Mom and dad would tell you to go to sleep. Don't call them again. It's past your bedtime. What would you do? Call them, them, right? Of course, back then you had to use the regular phone. You couldn't do the, the texting, right? And you're like, but mom and dad, you don't understand. This is love. I would do anything for them. I even dedicated a song on the radio and I put it on social media, that, that special lyric from that song. That is true love, us together. And you were willing to get grounded. And you were willing to, you know what I'm talking about? If I could just go, back then they had a skating rink. They don't do that anymore. When I was a kid, you went to the skating rink, right? And you held hands and you danced, or uh, not danced, but uh, roller skated around to like Aerosmith or, you know, something like that, right? And you were just in love. Mom, can I have five more minutes? Please, mom, I'm in love. Five more minutes. Please don't come to 1130, mom. I know we said 11, but 1130, please. Right? It's silly, but that's what we did, wasn't it? Right? Why? Because you were in love. And what was amazing about being in love is no one told you to change your behavior. Your behavior changed. Right? You see? Jesus is not after your behavior, ladies and gentlemen. He's after your heart. Amen? Amen. That's what I want you to see. Then it, am I the only one that did that? You know, back then you dedicated songs on the radio. You'd call in, hey, caller, who's this? My name is Rob, and uh, I'm from Tupelo, and uh, I want to dedicate this song to my one and only. <laughs> right? And you knew it was true love when you did that because you dedicated a song. Yes, and you recorded it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you see? That was real love. I'm being a little silly and being a little comical. 
but I want you to be reminded of the first time that Jesus saved you. That's why he says to, in the book of Revelation to remember your first love. That giddiness that <laughs> I can't believe he would save me. I want everybody to hear this. I'm willing to break whatever rules I need to do to share the gospel. And I want other people to know this. Some of us have become callous to that. And immune to that. And friend, I pray today the Holy Spirit would shake you to your very core. Amen. And that you would realize that you could never, ever get tired. You should never, ever get tired of preaching the message of grace. See? In other words, let me put it this way. We will only and truly develop love for God in our hearts when we are sure of his love for us. Listen. He tells her, where are your accusers? Well, I don't know. One by one, they're leaving. But now she could go live a transformed life because of all the little, all the little superficial, artificial, false loves that she was heading for. She met true love on that day. And she could have the power over that because she was assured that Jesus loves me. Do you see? That's what I want you to see today. We, we will only truly and develop love for God in our hearts when we are sure of his love for us. So I want to give you four points here, if I can. We're not going to put them on the screen. We're just going to talk today, okay? I like to break the, the, the routine up sometimes because sometimes you can get in that routine. It gets a little monotonous, a little mundane, right? I just want to talk to you. Number one is it's not going to be on the screen, right? They're going to probably go to a welcome screen or something like that. Number one is here's what I want our church to be. Here's what I pray for you to be. I pray that we would be dispensers of grace. Dispensers of grace. Let, let, me, let me tell you what I mean by that just real quickly, okay? The world doesn't need more Christians who can define who can teach and define and teach grace, but rather this world is in desperate need of those who are willing to dispense grace. See, here's what I want you to see in this passage of Scripture. The scribes and the Pharisees knew the law backwards and forwards. Right? But they didn't love Jesus. Because if they loved Jesus, they would have loved the people that Jesus came to save. See? See? I said this in our dream team meeting today. We should be dispensers of grace because we're connected to the fountain of grace. You see what I'm saying? He never runs out of grace. We should be dispensers. We don't need more Christians that just that, that, that define and teach grace. We need more Christians, believers, that dispense grace. Let me put it to you this way. Don't be so quick to pick up the rocks. Don't we, don't we tend to do that sometimes? We get like rock happy, don't we? Like, they call it trigger happy on, on a gun. I mean, we're like, we're like ready. I'm, I'm being real with you. Can I be, I'm just being real with you. There's some of us that have become so religious that we have this whole rock pile and we're just waiting. We got a PhD in rock throwing. Right? I'm, I'm, no, you don't get a lot of amens on that, but it's true. Don't be so quick to pick up the rocks because here's why. We've all fallen short, right? And we have no right to throw rocks at people. This is what Jesus was saying. He was basically saying this. Hey, any of you that have never broken the law, stay and throw a rock at her. Have you ever tried to keep the law? You ever try to keep the Ten Commandments? Right? Right? I mean, if we were to take a projector today and we had some, in Disney World, they had this thing called Tomorrowland. It was all about futuristic, you know, things. If we were in Tomorrowland today and we could up a projector to every one of our brains and project all the thoughts on the screens, how many would be willing to sign up for that today? <laughs> this is what Jesus was saying. You can throw the rock if you yourself have not broken the law. Paul writes in Romans 3, it's a very passive scripture, we're not going to put it on the screen, that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We, on our best day, will never meet God's righteous standard. Amen? Once again, the only one that had the authority and the right to throw the rock was the only one on that day that gave grace. 
See, Jesus was perfect. Jesus was sinless. But instead of throwing the rock, he showered her with grace. I want you to see that. Now, I want to be very careful here. I'm not saying Jesus gave her a license to sin. He didn't justify her sin. That's not what we're saying. Here's what I want you to see, though. That, and can we put it up on John 3, 16 and, and 17? I think they're going to put it on the screen for us. I want you to see this real quickly, okay, when they get ready to put it up. We know this part, right? For God so loved the world, we, he gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But let's go to 17, right? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. What I want you to see here is the one that has the sovereign power to judge, right, and had the right to throw the stone, realized what his mission was, what he was here to do for the glory of God. And that was to what? To save sinners. He realized that he was going to go and be punished on that cross and bear all of our sin, past, present, and future. He knew that about this woman, that as disgusting as this may have been and as perverse as this may have been, this act of adultery, he knew that he was coming to die for that sin. See, I I need you to see this today, that the one who had the right to throw the rock did not. But he knew that he had the power to save. He knew he had the power to forgive. But here's the cool thing. He had the power to transform her. Newsflash, real quickly. Your sin never surprises Jesus. Right? Breaking news, just in. Your sin never surprises Jesus because he came to bear and die for it all. See? Be dispensers of grace. I said this a few minutes ago, but I'll put it this way. These religious people in this passage knew the law, but they didn't know how to love. Isn't that, doesn't that happen with us sometimes is that we know this and we can quote all these scriptures and we know all the Christianese and the religious jargon, but we fail to love the person next to us. True gospel centered, listen, true gospel centered reading when it's really about Jesus, this should fuel you to love even more. See, don't let the enemy allow you to use this to hurt. Okay? Now, let me be very careful here. We live in a culture where everybody, babe, can I just say it for this one thing? Okay, she won't let me say it. In the old building, I used to say it a certain way, but she's, I'm, we're growing by the grace of God. They used to get, they get uptight. Just because you don't agree with anyone, right online, just because you don't agree with anyone today, all of a sudden I hate your guts. Okay? I have no problem admitting that I adhere to a conservative view of Scripture. And that if God says it's sin, it's sin. I don't care what political party says. I don't care what fancy this person says or what Oprah says or anybody else says. If God says it's sin, it's sin. This is not what I'm saying. And the reality is the gospel is offensive. I'll quote you a scripture, John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes into the Father but by me. That's offensive in this polytheistic, in this pluralistic culture that we live in that says there's many ways to God. I adhere to what Jesus says. He said, I'm the only way. So people are going to get their feelings hurt. That's not what I'm saying. But we should never go with the motive, the wrong motives of trying to hurt and exclude and and, and tear down people. That's not the gospel. And even if the gospel does offend and hurt, God always provides a redemptive way. We see it all through his scripture. That when he had to rebuke and chastise his people because he loved them, he always provided a way. Amen? Isn't that good? That's what being a dispenser of grace is. It's not walking around, everybody holding hands and singing songs about lollipops and dancing together. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is, why don't you throw grace first instead of the rock first? Amen? Can we get like one more amen on top of that? We got one amen. Can we get like one more? Okay, thank you. I thought it was in a religious church for a minute. I was going, man, jeez. Okay. I love what the great Charles Spurgeon said. He said it this way. 
and they're going to put it on the screen for us, and I'll read it to you. You cannot sin so much as God can forgive. Praise God. If it comes to a pitched battle between sin and grace, you shall not be so bad as God shall be good. That is scandalous grace, my friends. (laughs) I mean, that right there should bring you to your knees that this God would love this much. And if we are loved this much and we are sent here and we're here today to represent him, then we should be dispensers of grace. I mean, number two, and I used to hear this saying growing up and I never knew what it meant. But have you ever heard anybody say, don't be so spiritually minded that you're no earthly good? You ever heard anybody say that? I never understood that until I got my first taste of religiosity. Because the reality is, you can be the best Christian in the world. You can be the most poster child. Poster child. You could have everything right, and everybody adores you and loves you. You could even, for the charismatics, you could even speak in tongues very beautifully. But you'd be a butthole and a jerk. Babe, can I say butthole? I can say butthole. There. Okay. I should have asked her before I said it. I'm sorry. Beehole. I'm sorry, parents. Earmuffs, earmuffs, beehole. I'm not hating on the church because I love the church. What I'm saying is that we could be this kind of person. This is what they were essentially doing. They knew the law. They knew the Old Testament, right? They were doing all these things right, but they didn't love people. They were doing no good, right? You could be that way if you're not careful. You could fall out of relationship into religiosity. I mean, some... If you've been around the block a few times in this Christian thing for a while, how many people know what I'm, don't raise your hand, just, just, I'll raise my hand. How many people know what I'm talking about, right? You know, give me one of these or something, you know. (laughs) Baseball sign, right? You know what I'm talking about? And if we're honest, at various times in our Christian life, we have seeped into some of that, where we become so spiritually minded that we're no earthly good. We can't even relate to the people around us. That's what I loved about Jesus is that he was 100% God and 100% man, but he related to the people of his day. And he went and ate with them. When's the last time you went and ate with someone that you would never eat with? But I love Jesus. Praise God. When's the last time you went to the neighbor that you don't like or the coworker or the family member that you despise for whatever reason? When's the last time you went and led with grace instead of your feelings or anger? Do you see what I'm saying? But yet we love Jesus and we know all this gospel. The gospel should always transform us into being more like Jesus. I'm just, I mean, when you read this, you go... Wow, how do these people know this much of the law? They, like when people wanted to know if this was the right interpretation of the law, they went to the scribes. Like these jokers were like PhDs in the law. But yet Jesus was right in front of them and they didn't even know him. I don't want to be that kind of person, do you? I don't want to be that kind of Christian that's so spiritually minded that I don't realize that I have a mission here on earth. Yeah, I know all the songs say I can't wait to get to heaven. I can't wait to get to heaven too. But do you know, I want to bring heaven to earth while I'm here. And I want to live out the ministry of Jesus. Amen. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. He does the ministry of Jesus. They were zealous and passionate about being holy, which is a good thing, right? And I've said this, but I want to make sure I say it this way. But when we start using God's word to tear down, to hurt, to exclude, or to simply promote our own agenda, we are in error. That's not the gospel, friends. I've said it this way before, that we should be the most inclusive group of people that teaches the most exclusive truth. You hear me? We should be the most exclusive group of people that anyone wants. I mean, I invite everybody. I don't care. This is going to offend some of you, but I, I, don't, I don't care where they're at in their life. You want to know why? Because I don't have the power to change them, but I have the power to love them to the one who can. Yeah. Yeah. You see? I don't care who comes in the world, black, white, Mexican, a- Indian, Asian. I don't care what their gender orientation is. I don't even care if they don't even know what their gender orientation is because I know I can lead them to the one who can figure all that out and save them. Yeah. All right. 
That's what being a dispenser of grace. That's what being so spiritually minded, you're no earthly good. Be careful. Don't be so religious that you exclude the people that Jesus came to save. And the reality is it's all of us, right? Because we tend to focus on what? We tend to focus on the external. Well, I'm not as bad as them. No, friend, you're pretty bad. If, if you want to know how I know that, go read the book of Romans. It states it pretty clear. Paul was like, bam, Mike dropped out the whole book, right? This is who we are. Number three, not only do we want to be dispensers of grace, not only do we, we don't want to be so spiritually minded that we're not, not so earthly good, but number three is this. Listen to me. This, this one's, I, I almost wanted to take this one out because it, you know, it was a little hard. But we've got to own our own sin. These are the times you wish you had an amen app. <laughs> like a big healthy amen, King James amen. Amen. You know, like that big robust. Here's what I mean. We get so focused on other people's sin that we never own our own sin. And the reality is Jesus can't help anyone who's not willing to come naked, open, and transparent and be real. But we've created a culture where, we be, where we're fake. We've created a culture where we don't talk about things. I'm not saying to come up here every Sunday and throw all your garbage out there. You want to use wisdom, right? Because you've got some WTVA reporters in here. I didn't mean to say that. I'm sorry. I should have said it a different way, right? <laughs> babe, we just got back. From, I'm, I think Disney World got me a little amped up, babe. I'm sorry. Right? Use wisdom, but what I'm saying is some of us need to own our own sin. Can I just be blunt? When you look at the scripture, here's what owning our own sin is. I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I cannot save myself. I'm wicked. I'm broken. I'm in need of grace. I love the way the late R.C. Sproul said it, and they'll put it up on the screen. It says, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. And I know when you have a non-denominational church, we have different views on this. But can I just tell you something? Grace always focuses on the internal. Duty always focuses on the external. And if you don't own your own sin and you don't come to Jesus and say, I'm broken, I'm in need. God, here's all of my chunk. I'd lay it at your feet. Then how do you have the right to pick up the rocks and throw it at someone else? And do it all in the name of religion. That's what was happening in this chapter. This is why we talked about grace for three weeks. Because we need to be reminded what grace really is. Right? Does that make sense? Understand that grace will meet you in the middle of your sin. That grace will meet you in the middle of your mess. And your junk. But here's the better news. It won't leave you there. Right? That's how powerful grace is. And listen, 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 I, I want you to see something here. And this is going to be, I debated whether saying this, but here, what we do sometimes is we try to make sin this external thing outside of us, whether it's the core of who we are. That's why Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 17, 9, he said the heart is desperately wick, or some versions say desperately uh, sick. Who can understand it? And so what we do is we do all these things to keep us from owning our sin and making it outside of us. But if we don't understand the depth and the magnitude of our sin, then we'll never ever truly appreciate and experience the joy and the rejoicing that is found in the grace that saves us from it. Right? This is why we say things like, don't hate the sinner, hate the sin. Do you know that's nowhere in the Bible? Now, I've got to be careful because I don't want somebody to leave here. Are you saying God hates sinners? Well, yes and no. Let's go to the Bible. It's not in your, it's not in your notes, but you can write it down. Psalm 7, 11. God is a just judge and is angry with the wicked every day. 
John chapter 3, go down to verse 36 we were just in. Go look at it. Don't take my word for it. Psalm 5, I can keep going on and on and on. God is angry with sinners because the Bible says that we are children of wrath. And it's only because of the cross of Christ that he absorbed the righteous and holy wrath of God on our behalf that when we profess our faith in him, that now we become new creations in Christ. So yes, God does love sinners. He does. But he's also angry with the wicked every day. You see how we can take man-made stuff? Because it's nowhere in the Bible. God hates sin. God is disgusted. Actually, Psalm in in chapter 3 says he abhors evildoers. He abhors it. Own your sin before you try to throw the rocks at someone else. You don't get a lot of, that that part doesn't get a lot of amens. I know that. Here's the thing. We will always struggle saying no to the world until we own our sin. Here's why. Because we'll never be able to rejoice in the depth of his love for us. And when we, when we understand that, listen, we are fully assured of his love for us. It gives us the power to live a transformed life. Does that make sense? See? Some of us are settling for lesser loves. And Jesus is reminding you today of his love for you. And that when you are fully of your shirt of his love for you, it gives you the power to live a transformed life. I need you to see that today. Finally, Not only do I want you to be dispensers of grace, not only do I want us to not be so spiritually minded that we're not earthly good, not only do I want us to own our own sin to be a church that's real, we can't just wear t-shirts that say we're real, right? And we don't allow people to be real. Does that make sense? It kind of defeats the whole purpose, doesn't it? Okay. Okay, I guess I thought that was fun. Nobody else did, but anyhow. God help him. Praise God. Pray for him, God. All right, here we go. Number four. Here's one. Truly love people. Well, that's a big one. One of our anchor words here is to love unconditionally. And the reason I wanted us to put that in there is because I wanted all of us to challenge, challenge all of us to love beyond just the natural means. Because the Holy Spirit lives in you if you're a born-again believer, and he gives you the supernatural power to love the unlovable. You want to know how I know that? Because we were all unlovable, and he loved us. Amen? And he excused, like C.S. Lewis said, the inexcusable because of the cross of Christ. To truly love people. But I want you to see here is quit trying to get people to change first. That's loving conditionally. But isn't that what we do? See, Jesus didn't go, I want you to go do this, 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 and this, and then I will forgive you of your sins and go and sin no more. No, he said, I love you, now go sin no more. You see, do you understand what I'm saying? See, loving unconditionally, listen to this, it's very important, allows people, right, knowing that God loves them and is assured of their love for them, but also aided with our love. When people come to a faith family that know that they love them no matter what, listen, it allows them to walk in more victory because they don't have to worry about earning our love. Because here's the thing, if they have to earn our love, what are they automatically going to think? They have to earn God's love. Right? Does that make sense? Listen, some of you missed it. You promote this Jesus of love, and he loves, and he loves, and he's full of grace, but yet your actions and your attitude is different. But if they have to earn your love, they're automatically going to think they have to earn the Father's love. Why? Because you're supposed to be representing the Father. Come on. Right? Truly love people. Jesus puts acceptance before change because he knew she would never have the power to change unless she was assured of his acceptance. Being fully accepted, fully forgiven, and fully loved allowed her to have the power to say no to that and yes to Jesus. Can I just tell you something? He doesn't partially save people. He doesn't partially love people. 
He doesn't partially forgive people. And believer, this is to the believer first, and then I want to talk to those that may don't know Jesus. Maybe you need to be reminded of this again today. That the reason you are so quick to pick up the rocks and so quick to use the word of God to hurt and to do damage is because you fully haven't grasped what it means to be fully forgiven, fully accepted, fully saved. So here's what I want for you today. Listen, I'm speaking to all of those those Christians here real quickly. I want you today to breathe in grace for the first time afresh. And realize that you're forgiven. God doesn't make mistakes in saving people. Imagine that. He loves you. And he's for you. Walk in that and you will see and treat people that don't know Christ and even those that do in a totally different way. See, I tell people I have no right to be offended because he was offended for me 2,000 years ago. And I can guarantee you his offense was greater than mine. Amen. So I want to speak to you real quickly if you don't know Jesus. Maybe your life is like this. Maybe your life is like this woman's. Maybe it's a mess. Maybe you're living in adultery right now. Maybe there's a believer in here today who's flirting with the woman she, she, he shouldn't be flirting with or the man she shouldn't be flirting with. Maybe, maybe your life is a wreck like this woman. And friend, I can tell you this with absolute 100% certainty that he will meet you in the middle of that mess. But if you don't know Jesus today, maybe this is the first time that you say yes to him. And you lay your yes down to him. So I'm going to pray over you for that. I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit would lead you to do that. That you would know him for the first time today. Maybe you're a religious person who has a history of being a rock thrower instead of a grace dispenser. Listen, God can flip that script in a minute. Amen. Maybe that's been you. Whatever role you play in this story we see, I know there's grace, enough grace to go around, to save and to restore, to heal. And if that's you today, I just want you to cry out to him in your seat. Okay, we're gonna pray. Father, we love you and we thank you. And God, I thank you that you just don't leave us in our mess. So, Father, maybe we're that religious person in the story who just needs to understand what grace is afresh, that needs to know what it means to be in relationship with you. God, would you destroy any wrong motives or agendas in our heart that we would try to use you to hurt anybody, to tear down? Right now, God, would you kick those walls down? God, maybe we're the woman in the story. Maybe we're, our life is a mess. It's a train wreck and it's just, we're all over the place. Maybe we're caught in sexual sin. Maybe we're caught in some other type of sin, God. Right now, would your grace and love fill this room? And would you assure every heart in this room that when you say you love them, you mean it? and they can be rest assured of your love. And if that's, you don't know that today, then your first step is if you don't know Jesus, to say yes to Jesus. So right now, if that's you, we're gonna take time as they lead us. We're gonna say yes to Jesus. And you say, well, Pastor Rob, where does that start? Well, I can't give you the words to say, but here's what I can encourage you to do is just to crowd in desperation for him. Forgive me, God. Forgive me. I need you. I need your grace. I need your mercy. I make a really horrible God. Little God, I make a horrible sovereign. I need you to save me. I repent of my sins. I'm waving the white flag of surrender today. If that's you in your seat, you cry out to him. For the rest of us, whatever other role we play in this story, let's just ask for his grace today. Let's repent if we need to repent. And let's allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and through us. Will you guys lead us? I usually ask y'all to declare this with me, but after that message, I'm going to ask you to confess this with me. Come on, be 
you know it, sing it with us. I confess for you God we're desperate for you my right oh God we're desperate for you I need come on let's sing it again come on I need you God come on church come on be broken for him we're broken for you God God break our hearts Jesus oh God squash us God and let Jesus be seen through our lives. We love you, God. We love you. My righteousness. Come on, church. Our God. Come on, let's do it again. I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. Come on. I need you. Oh, I need. Come on. Oh, I need. Yes, God. We're desperate for you, Jesus. We're desperate for you, God. We can't do it without you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. You're my one. Yes. Yes, yes. My right. 
righteousness, O oh God, how I need you. Listen, look, I know we're supposed to get out of here at 12 and all that kind of stuff. Listen to me. If we're not going to be broken here, we won't be broken out there. Right? Broken people reach other broken people. We are desperate need of God's grace. We are in desperate need of God. We cannot do this without him. Right? Can we just sing it one more time? I know some of you got to be at the cheese dip line and I get it. But can we just do it one more time? That God, we need you. I promise you, he never gets tired of hearing it. Can we just do that, Sarah? Can we do that? And I pray that God would even visit you in your dreams tonight, that God would shake you to your core and that you would be broken for your family, broken for your friends, broken for your city, broken for your community, because that's the only way that we will ever reach anyone. Can we sing it? No, just sing the chorus. Come on. Will you help us? Lord, I need you. Come on. Oh, I need you. Come on. Break past the superficial. Break past the emotionalism. Right? Run into his grace today. I need you, my one defense, my righteousness. He's my only defense. The only reason I could stand before God is because of Jesus. You're my one defense, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Listen, Celebration Church, we don't want to play religious games. We need God. He's the only one that's going to save, He's the only one that's going to transform and deliver. Amen. Amen. Listen, if you're new here today, you go, man, these guys are a bunch of wackos, man. They, no, no, no. Here's the thing. We're just radical for Jesus because we love him because he loved us. Amen. So as we close today and we finish up and we close shop, here's what I want to make you aware of just a few things real quickly. Number one is this is our time where we do our offering. And uh, this is mainly for those that call Celebration Church their faith family home and their church. And I'll put a little graphic on the screen that tells you how to do that. And we like to celebrate Jesus not only in the music and, and, and the teaching of his word, but also through our sacrificial and generous giving. So I'm going to pray over that. But listen, I don't want you to leave today. If you still need prayer, right, we, we have our prayer team. That's going to start. Miss Debbie's here. I think we got Peyton's going to be coming up as well. He's going to be over here. If you say, hey, even though we're closing here, God doesn't ever close shop, okay? Right? We're just closing this meeting together. But if you need to stay after and you need prayer, you need someone to pray with you and counsel with you, talk with you, our prayer team is here to do that. But I'm going to pray over our offering. But I mean it. I mean this. I pray that God would just wreck your heart this week for your city, for your neighbors, for your friends. And I pray if you've been that religious person that he would turn your world upside down and that you would know what it means to walk and live in relationship with him.